I think we'll get started without the screen. Somebody might show up in a bit to get it fixed. Uh, there's actually, you know, I, it's, it, I'm just going to uh, write some stuff on the board because there's actually two slides that I, I added uh, to today's lecture just to kind of, I wanted to make clear to you all uh, the difference between like traditional transition state theory for calculating uh, kinetic rate parameters and then the, the typical Arrhenius rate law. So, uh, and then we'll get into the, the content that you guys have. And today we're going to talk more about uh, the discovery of uh, combustion mechanisms as they relate to uh, free radical driven processes and then also how uh, the early scientists about 100 years ago found out these mechanisms and then uh, without the use of computers were actually able to verify that they're, they're accurate. So, okay, yes, uh, yesterday we talked a lot about, okay, basics of thermodynamics and uh, kinetics. One thing I did not cover was just your basic transition state theory, okay? And I'll, again, I'll draw you a simple uh, potential energy diagram here with uh, this, this is the potential energy of, a, of your system and the reaction coordinate here. So we showed yesterday if you have some reactants, they grow over a barrier and they make products. Uh, these are your reactants. This is your products. Now in your traditional like uh, Arrhenius uh, type kinetics, you'll call this barrier for the reaction the activation energy, but it's not necessarily the activation energy as we see it in your typical uh, rate equation. We can call this, this is some energy barrier for the reaction to happen. Here you have some species in the reactants. These reactants have uh, a specific conformation that uh, they in their lowest energy states, and we can calculate the energy of those uh, conformations, the lowest energy conformers, using uh, quantum chemistry tools. Same thing, you can do that for the products. Now, the theory of transition state transition state theory came by a, a chemist named Polanyi, and he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, for his discovery of a tr transition state theory uh, and his applications of transition state theory to many things. It was, it's just a theory that said that for a reaction to happen, there has to be some activated complex in the middle. This activated complex, he called it a transition state. Okay. So there's some activated complex. The reactants or a single reactant Let's say, let's just say it's uh, ethane that has to dissociate. Say the overall reaction is this molecule has to dissociate, breaking that CC bond. If you take ethane and you heat it up to about 1100 degrees C, you know, this CC bond can start to break. How does it happen? Well, it's not like it goes, the overall reaction says it just goes to maybe two CH3 groups, okay, that break apart if you break this bond here. And that could be an elementary reaction, yeah. Uh, how does this really happen? Well, it has to overcome some barrier. You've got to put some energy into the system. So what he said is this bond here between the two carbons lengthens, okay. So initially it might be some distance, but as you heat up the mixture, this bond will lengthen, 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 and eventually it'll... Before it splits, it'll form the transition state, this activated complex where it's very close to breaking, but it hasn't broke yet. And like that, that could be for a unimolecular reaction, for two molecules, bimolecular reaction, say something has to come and grab a hydrogen, OH radical has to come and, or H radical, or some other radical comes and wants to pull off a hydrogen. Again, this OH has to come into close, close proximity with this hydrogen. And as they're in close proximity, they'll form this transition state, this activated complex, and then eventually dissociate uh, to the products. So the general reaction you can say is you have A plus B, if it's a bimolecular reaction, these go to form your transition state, okay? And then your transition state dissociates to your, to your products. 
He said that this initial reaction, the A plus B going to the transition state is uh, equilibrium. It's an equilibrium. So as A and B are in close proximity to each other, they form the activated complex, but the activated complex could also dissociate quickly back to the reactants in equilibrium. But once this becomes at its uh, lowest energy conformer, it will dissociate directly to products. So the, the final reaction, A, B star, this activated complex going to the products is, is a burialist reaction, okay? Burialist in the sense that as soon as the complex is formed, it will dissociate uh, to the products. Now, what we can say here is because this first so-called reaction is reversible, you can apply the principles of thermodynamics to it, okay? So the therm thermodynamic laws apply to this reactant going to the activated complex. Similarly, the products, if it's a reverse reaction, products going to the activated complex. So if the thermodynamic laws apply, then the equilibrium constant for this activated complex has to equal the concentration of the reactants, or sorry, the concentrations of the products divided by the reactants, just like we saw yesterday. So AB is this uh, transition state. Okay, and of course, there's no really real concentration, but uh, again, in principle of thermodynamics, we, can, we could write this equation. And then the overall rate of the reaction uh, simply becomes some frequency of the decomposition reaction, the activated complex going to the products times the equilibrium constant K. So you could say the rate of this uh, reaction could be related to nu times uh, equilibrium constant to form the transition state times the concentration of the reactants. This is just some frequency of decomposition. And if we use the spigot, basic equations, we can start to say uh, what these, uh, what numbers we can apply to these different, uh, different uh, parameters here. So the frequency of decomposition, uh, he says, could be related to Boltzmann, Boltzmann theory. So you have the Boltzmann constant times the temperature divided by Planck's constant will give us that frequency of de decomposition. So this is based on absolute rate theory. If you form the transition state, sorry. It's simply this. The rate of the uh, decomposition, that frequency of decomposition nu, should be the Boltzmann constant times temperature divided by Planck's constant. You put that back into that equation. You can say the rate is now KBT over H times the equilibrium constant times CACB, okay? And uh, Boltzmann constant, you guys can know it's a standard constant, same Planck's constant H. So this is Planck's constant. And that's KB is Boltzmann constant. So how do we get the activation, how do we get this uh, equilibrium constant? What was the basic equation again? For any equilibrium constant, it's related to the Gibbs free energy of the reaction, right? So we just said uh, any equilibrium constant is delta G, sorry, exponential minus delta G over RT. Now this delta G is the delta G, okay, of forming the reactants going to the transition state. So it's a reaction. It's delta G of reaction for the, the reaction between the reactant and the transition state, or vice versa, versa the product and the transition state. And, uh, yeah, and again, delta G, you know this. We can calculate delta G
from the, from the entropy and the enthalpy. And again, delta H here is delta H reaction for the formation of the transition state. Delta S is the delta S change in entropy for the formation from reactants to the transition state. So how do you get these numbers? Well, you can get them from quantum chemical calculations if you know the electronic structure of the molecule. So if we know, if we, we will have to do a ab initio calculation. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, maybe later today and tomorrow to how we can calculate the energy of a molecule in its stable state using tools like Gaussian or mole pro software that's available for quantum chemistry calculations. You, you try to find out the conformer of the molecule, the geometry, and based on the lowest energy conformer, you can get the energy of a molecule, the enthalpy, so to speak, H. And then you could do the same thing for the entropy. You can then postulate what your transition state looks like. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. No one's ever seen a transition state. It's a, let's say it's an ephemeral uh, molecule. Yeah? It, as soon as it's formed, it disappears. But, so, but in a computer, you could hypothesize uh, in, in calculations, how this, uh, this uh, transition state, this activated complex looks. So what we do in a calculation, we take two molecules and we bring them, we, we find their lowest energy conformers. They might be rotating, vibrating, translating. We bring them closer, closer, closer together. And as you bring them closer together, you'll find some complex based on the conformation of how these molecules are that they have the, an, activate, an energy which is related to this uh, maximum barrier for this reaction. And then you can say this conformation of these two molecules to coming together is the transition state. And in the calculations, we have ways of identifying you know, how that transition state actually is a real transition state. So then, 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 then you get the energy for that conformer, that, that complex. That energy can have an enthalpy, it can have an entropy, and then you can calculate the delta H and the delta S for the formation of uh, this transition state. So if we look at the, this equation, for this I equation was eventually called the Ehring equation, because Ehring came up with the overall theory and, and the mathematics behind it. It says that K, the rate constant K, is equal to KBT over H exponential It should be minus, exponential of minus delta G over RT, or, or in entropy terms, S delta S dagger over R minus, uh, or you say times exponential and we should have, yeah, minus here, RT, okay? So this is the Ehring equation. So this is how the rate constant can be calculated. If you know delta S for this reaction between the reactant and transition state, if you get delta H dagger between the reaction and transition state, you have Boltzmann constant, Planck's constant, you can get, and depending on temperature, you'll calculate your so-called rate constant, yeah? The same rate constant. And that would be, of course, K forward for the reaction. Now, how did that compare to our Arrhenius law? Or again, Arrhenius was so you see, there's some similarities, but they're not the same. Okay, so when Arrhenius, and again, we even had a modified Arrhenius expression, right? We can put t to the n here. So when Arrhenius came up with this law, he never had any idea of transition state theory. Uh, all they did, he, it was always based on experiments. So in the 1800s, people used to do experiments, put reactants in a vessel, ch change the temperature, then plot the reaction rate constant as a function of this k as a function of temperature, and then fit that, equa fit that data with a line. And he said this, this uh, equation some, you can have t to the n, you cannot have t to the n. Uh, this equation can be used to fit the data, yeah? And this is what we use in all the codes. And it's not, I mean, there's no theory behind why. Uh, he, he, the theory was there that, okay, there's some pre-exponential term related to the, uh, 
collision theory, how many reactions could happen. There was some idea that there is a barrier to a reaction, but the theory of transition states was not uh, fully articulated. It was only Ehring, Polanyi that brought this about. And then you start to see the difference. So you can see in this equation, exponential delta S over R, okay, there's no temperature term here, but delta S is temperature dependent, right? Entropy changes as a function of temperature. The entropy of these molecules will change, and this activated complex will change with temperature. Delta H has a temperature dependence term. KBT over H, of course, you're multiplying by temperature. So there's no one-to-one -one correlation of these parameters. Even the activated, the so-called Arrhenius constant A, if you look here, has some temperature dependence terms in transition state theory. So what do we typically do in uh, kinetics, quantum chemistry? We will calculate these energies. We'll calculate entropies at different temperatures for the reactant, the transition state. And then we'll calculate a K at different temperatures based on this theory. And then you'll make a same plot. You'll make a plot of K versus temperature based on the energies that are calculated for your system. And then you'll fit that again with an Arrhenius uh, rate equation. So that's why in, your, in all the models, in all the uh, yeah, software, we still use the Arrhenius rate equation because for simplicity, that's the best. But we, when we actually do the calculations, we simply make all the calculations of K versus T, make a plot, and then refit it with uh, the Arrhenius law. And uh, yeah, okay, so that's, that's just, to, I wanted to clarify those two differences between you know, typical transition state theory and Arrhenius law. So when you look at reactions, again, you don't automatically assume these, this activation energy is not the same as, again, as, as this barrier for reaction necessarily. There's uh, Professor Trular in Minnesota. He hates even the activation, <laughs> the Arrhenius law. So, it's, you know, typically you have A exponential EA of RT, then people added T to the end. He has an Arrhenius law with like five parameters that are to be fit. So he has a, like a pre-exponential term, uh, several temperature de dependence terms, and maybe even a different uh, exponential terms. Because as uh, he's doing quantum chemistry on very uh, strange reactions, and in the end, he'll calculate K as a function of T that's very accurate, and he wants to make sure that his form that he gives to researchers has an exact fit and with the, with the Ehring equation uh, derived values. And so he'll add more parameters to this equation to make those fits better. But typically, the Arrhenius law is good enough. You might have errors of like 2 or 3% across a broad temperature range, say from 200 to 2,000 Kelvin. The Arrhenius law usually fits, but there might be errors, about 2 to 3%. If you want to get rid of those errors, you've got to add more parameters to the fitting. All right. OK, while he's here, uh, we'll just wait for him to, to finish fixing it, and we'll start with the slides. I also have to watch, because I'll have to do it tomorrow again, right? <laughs> I saw the, I saw it. <laughs> Which one it was? We even film it. The mysterious plug. The mysterious plug. <laughs> now we're over Ethernet. We'll get you every time. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Why does it go red? Why does it go red? Sometimes it's. Yeah, it's just kind of in the standby. But it's just uh, actually a, a sensor. But it, obviously, it's not working if it's red in your <laughs> So it's, it's kind of all locked up.
go. Why not? Thank okay. you. All right, thanks a lot. All right, no problem. All right, good timing. Okay, so yeah, these were the two slides I added. Basically everything we covered here about transition state theory and uh, yeah, the second slide showing the comparison to the rate equation, Arrhenius and the Ehring equation. And I'll, I'll, I'll put, you know, I, I always add slides at the end, so what you guys might have <laughs> might be a bit different than what I have. That's just the way I, I am, so. Uh, yeah, they asked me to send those slides like a month ago. Well, a month ago is long. It's like it's like an eternity for me. Yeah. I, I, I usually prepare things in the last few days. So I've added, even today I've added some slides. I'll add a Dropbox. So at the end of the, the class, you know, you'll get, you can download all the slides again from the Dropbox link. Uh, the exact ones that I have here. Okay, so uh, you know, we, so we've talked about. Okay, we're going to go much more today now into detailed reaction mechanisms, different types of initiation reactions free radical propagation and branching reactions and termination. But first, let's look at a, you know, a very simple reaction scheme uh, between two molecules, hydrogen and iodine. So hydrogen iodide reaction. Now this is a straight, very straightforward reaction. You take hydrogen and iodine, and uh, it's a reversible reaction. You make hydrogen iodide, two moles of it. Now right away, I can look at it and tell you it's most likely not an elementary reaction, right? Because obviously for this reaction to happen, First, you have to dissociate the two hydrogens. Then you have to dissociate the two oxygens. But this is kind of the reaction chemistry, the reactions that uh, maybe the early chemists might have looked at in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they, they look at this reaction. They conduct the reaction experiment. Uh, and they measure the hydrogen iodide concentration at different concentrations of hydrogen and iodine. You can measure the change in concentration with time. So the rate of formation of hydrogen iodide should be affected by some forward rate constant and some reverse rate constant because it's in equilibrium. So rate of change of I or HI with respect to temperature uh, is uh, the change in concentration of HI with respect to temperature, some forward rate constant KF times the hydrogen concentration times the iodine concentration times two because you're making two moles of HI and then minus the reverse rate which is two times KR uh, the reverse rate constant times the hydrogen iodine concentration squared. And if this reaction is happening at equilibrium, then the forward reaction production of hydrogen iodide equals the reverse uh, consumption of hydrogen iodine back to the reactants. So you could say 2KF times a hydrogen concentration equilibrium, iodine concentration equilibrium minus 2KR times the hydrogen iodide concentration at equilibrium squared is equal to zero. And then again, you can get this kind of relation. KF over KR is the hydrogen iodide concentration squared divided by the reactant concentrations. And that's equal to your equilibrium constant. And again, then we see these forward and reverse rates are then equal, equal or related to the equilibrium constant. And uh, you can then also relate now Instead of having a reverse rate, you can replace equilibrium constant with your reverse rate, and you can get this final equation where it's only a function of the forward rate and the equilibrium constant. So the rate of change of HI with respect to temp uh, temperature is uh, simply the forward reaction times the concentrations of the reactants minus the uh, 2KF, the forward rate, divided by the KC. So, okay divided by Kc, the equilibrium constant, times Hi squared. And the, the, when the chemist looked at this type of reaction, they said, okay, fine. It follows law of mass action. It looks normal, right? There would, be, there would never be any reason to suspect that you know, this reaction needs to first split the hydrogen, needs to split the iodine, form a transition state, or have a series of reactions. So there's, there's, no, there's no indication, right? You do the measurements, they follow the uh, standard mass action kinetics. You see the, 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 the formation rates are related to the stoichiometric coefficients, the equilibrium constants, and everything makes sense. And so nobody really suspected for many years that uh, the law of mass action kinetics did not apply, or, or, or some reaction systems were so complex that they did not uh, follow the law of mass action kinetics. And even this reaction is actually a complex reaction 
It doesn't happen as one single step, but apparently it looks like it does, so you don't suspect anything. It was only in the 19, like early 1915s, 1920, people started to see reactions by doing experiments that were a bit strange, that didn't follow what they expected, yeah? And one of the famous uh, reactions was acid aldehyde uh, decomposition, so a very simple molecule. CH3, CHO, okay? The most basic aldehyde is formaldehyde, CH2O. The second one is acid aldehyde. And people started doing experiments with this molecule in the 1920s, and they found some weird things happening, okay? And this was, and uh, they tried to understand why, why is this system behaving differently and it's not following exactly what, ex what we expect. So a very famous paper by our friend Hinshelwood, as we saw, our, our uh, godfather of kinetics, who won the Nobel Prize. He had a paper in 1926 in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. So he was in the UK. And in those days, uh, you know, it wasn't like you could just go find papers anywhere. They were just shared in uh, conferences. Like we have our combustion symposium. People would go to the conferences, they would submit their papers, and they would discuss with each other, yeah? and. Uh, and it wasn't unlikely that uh, you had scientists from Europe, UK, US, all at the same conference. You know, they were actually quite isolated in those days. You just know travel wasn't uh, widely uh, accessible to many people. So a lot of the work was done, and we'll see that, in different places. So in Royal, Royal Society of, of the Chemistry in the UK, actually it was the Royal Society of Physics at that time, only became Royal Society of Chemistry as a branch later on. They had these meetings, Hinshel would, would go there and his paper was, okay, a comparison between unimolecular and bimolecular gaseous reactions, the thermal decomposition of acid aldehyde in the gas phase. And then he had another paper in 1933, the thermal decomposition of acid aldehyde and the existence of different activated states. And uh, again, this is about eight, eight, nine years apart, two different papers. The second paper, a plot, is shown here that was taken from that paper. So the, these guys were not, didn't have uh, fancy experiments, uh, shock tubes and stirred reactors. They, experiments in those days were pretty basic. They just take a, ba they take a vessel, okay? Like a, a glass bulb, spherical bulb, and uh, they fill it up with gas and uh, they're able to heat it up. They can go to very high temperature, but usually they can have, they had th uh, resistance heating tapes or they might uh, use a, uh, a burner to heat up different points of the chamber. And they will measure then uh, by extracting the gas, the change in uh, some composition of species. And usually they'll be using either some titration methods or other types of very simple chemistry uh, diagnostic tools to see the change of, of some species. So here he says in the summary of this paper, he, he takes a, a vessel and he says the rate of change of acid aldehyde has been measured over a range of initial pressures from 0.2 to 1,100 millimeters of mercury. So actually, they, they had access to vacuum technology in those days, so they could go sub-atmospheric, yeah? And he says the curve obtained is shown here. So this is the pressure on the x-axis and the, the concentration measure, or the rate of decomposition that's measured. He says the curve obtained by plotting the reciprocal of time of half decomposition, so the half-life, against the initial pressure shows an abrupt change in slope, which can only be explained by assuming the reaction to be kinetically composite or com complex. Because if it follows law of mass action kinetics, as you change pressure or temperature, you should just have a, a linear change in your, uh, in your rate of decomposition. It says the results can be interpreted by theory that the acid aldehyde molecule can be activated in a limited number of ways and that the different activated states are associated with different transformation probabilities. There are thus several virtually independent quasi-unimolecular decompositions for the same chemical reaction. So he he's, he's doesn't know exactly what's happening yet, yeah? but he's saying it's not, uh, it's not so straightforward. It's not like acid aldehyde just decomposes to products. This decomposition is happening through, he thought at that time, different activated states. So different 
molecules or form maybe different transition states, even though they didn't have the concept of transition state at that time. But he's thinking that, again, the something is not resulting in a direct decomposition. It's allowing this molecule, this acid aldehyde, to decompose in different ways. And he's thinking about this all just from the observation of his experiments. Uh, and still, by 1933, he didn't have a clear idea what was happening, okay? It was these two guys, uh, Francis Rice and Carl Hers Hersfeld, which first tried to articulate uh, what is happening in the experiments that uh, Hinshel would, was doing in, in, in UK. So Francis, these guys were actually here in the US at uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, and they wrote a paper in Jack's Journal of the American Chem Chemical Society. So you had the Royal Society in the UK, you had the American Chemical Society in the US. This guy, Rice, was actually a PhD student in the UK, and he, then he came over to the US, and the first place he landed in the US was right here in Princeton, okay? And he came and he was a chemist here in Princeton, and then he got hired uh, to go to uh, Johns Hopkins to be uh, like a research scientist and then an assistant professor. And then Hersfeld, he came from Germany. He worked in, with many of the leading scientists like Bodenstein in Germany and Austria. And he also came to Johns Hopkins University. And these two guys started, Francis said, hey, I've seen these experiments in the UK that people are doing, what's going on? Hersfeld had seen similar experiments in, and we'll see those later, of photochemical reactions that are done in, in Germany, and they started to think, maybe similar phenomena is happening. And they said, this is a very straightforward reaction equation. Acid aldehyde decomposes to methane and CO. So again, it's, you can look at this reaction, you can say it's hard for this to happen in one single step, but in those days people thought things happen as a single step. But when they start doing the experiments, they measure the, uh, the reaction rate, and they see the reaction rate is proportional to some rate constant K, which is a function of temperature, times the concentration of acid aldehyde raised to the three halves. So why three halves? Now one out one half, one out five halves. Well, it's supposed to be one. If it's an elementary reaction, if it follows the law of mass action kinetics, it should be K times the acid aldehyde concentration. Well, the measurements that Hinshelwood did and then others, they repeated some experiments, Rice and Hersfeld, and they found that, uh, yeah, it was three halves. So they tried to explain, why, how could it be three halves? There must be something leading to this specific number three halves. And then we'll see, okay, they started to write down different reactions that could be happening uh, to result in the three halves. So by the way, these guys, Rice and Hersfeld, they were the ones who first explained uh, the phenomena, but uh, they don't get the Nobel Prize, okay? The Nobel Prize still went to Hinshelwood because he did the experiment, yeah? And uh, he found these first interesting things, and then, of course, he learned, later on learned from Rice and Hersfeld and others and uh, built even more complicated reaction schemes. And uh, Rice, I think, both, both these guys eventually left Johns Hopkins. Actually, very good chemist, very good scientist, but never became famous because of academic politics. So <laughs> I think Rice eventually ended up in some Catholic university because uh, the dean didn't like him, and Hersfeld, the president of the university, didn't like him either. So they, <laughs> a lot of politics, and they were both, uh, they took their funding away, shut down their labs, and once you do that, yeah, these guys leave and they go to smaller places, and they both never became like very famous, but these papers that they wrote from period of like 1930 to 1936 were the foundations of like, everything we do in kinetics uh, today. So what they said is this, they said, they just first, okay, let's have, maybe it's not one reaction, maybe it's a series of reactions. So they wrote four reactions. They said, first, the acid aldehyde breaks apart to form a methyl radical and a CH3 uh, CHO, or sorry, a CHO radical. So again, this, this is acid aldehyde, yeah? They said the first step is, this guy breaks, right? If this guy breaks, this bond, this CC bond, then you'll get a methyl radical and you'll get a CHO radical. This, they wrote down the reaction, okay? It's just a guess. It's not like they didn't observe anything. They didn't see methyl radicals. They didn't see formal radical CHO. They just guessed. This is the first step. 
Then they said, okay, maybe this methyl radical, now it's a radical, it needs to stabilize itself. It goes and grabs a hydrogen, yeah, from acetaldehyde, a hydrogen abstraction reaction. And again, it's just a guess. They said the methyl radical goes and it pulls off a hydrogen, one of those hydrogens from, of course, another acetaldehyde that's in the system. And it forms uh, a CH3CO CH3 radical, this carbonyl. Oh, and they even said which hydrogen it takes off, right? They said it takes off this hydrogen connected to the oxygen. And they were smart enough at that time to know about thermodynamics, yeah, and bond dissociation energies at least. And the bond dissociation energy of a hydrogen bonded to a carbon, bonded to another carbon, is weaker than a hydrogen that's bonded to a carbon bonded to a oxygen. Because this oxygen is very electronegative, it's pulling all the electrons there, it weakens this CH bond. So they were smart enough to know that from thermodynamics. And, and they said that's the second reaction. You pull off the hydrogen next to the carbonyl group. And then you make uh, methane becomes, methyl becomes methane, acetaldehyde becomes this uh, uh, CH3CO radical. Then this radical, yeah, CH3CO, will decompose. So you've lost, you've lost this one, so it has to decompose. Okay, and they're saying it's a rather, it's called an alpha scission reaction. So, of course, you could decompose by breaking these H's. That's a beta scission. They say it's an alpha scission, so this bond breaks, and then you get carbon monoxide plus uh, methyl radical, yeah? So they say that's the third step, carbon monoxide plus methyl radical. And then finally, a fourth step, uh, two methyl radicals recombine to form ethane, C286. Just a guess. And you can present, and then they, they write it in this way. Uh, and they said this scheme is actually has some similarities uh, to other types of reactions that chemists have been observing in Germany. They call free radical driven reaction. So this is the first presentation of a chain reaction scheme for a hydrocarbon in a thermal system, okay? And this is just a different representation. They say this acetaldehyde, as you heat it up, again, it breaks apart to form methyl radical. The methyl radical reacts again with acetaldehyde to form CH3CO radical. And this guy decomposes to make a CO and methyl radical and this loop keeps re re repeating, yeah? Because you started here with acetaldehyde, you make a methyl radical, it decomposes, you make another methyl radical, so you're propagating the reaction, ra radical propagation reaction. This keeps happening, this inner loop. Eventually, though, some of you, de you deplete all of your CH3CHO, it reacts with methyl radical in this second step. And uh, eventually, then you only have methyl radicals. They recombine, and they form ethane. And so you see three different types of reactions we have here. An initiation reaction. It's the first reaction where the acetaldehyde breaks apart. That initiates the overall cyclical process. Then you have a P, a propagation reaction. Propagation, the methyl radical reacts with acetaldehyde to form another radical and then this decomposes to form methyl again. So these are two different propagation steps. They call radical propagation step. And then finally you have termination. So the reaction stops when the methyl radicals recombine, they terminate to form ethane. So every mechanism you see today has these three different types and one more type we call branching. But the three first that people postulated were initiation, thermal initiation reaction, then radical propagation reactions, then termination reaction. So again, you want to build a mechanism, you can start very simply. These, find out what are all, all the different initiation steps that are possible, find out all the different propagation steps that are possible, find out all the different termination steps that are possible, and you can start writing out all the different uh, reactions. Again, these guys did it based just on hypothesis, and again, what their goal is, is to find out why this is three halves. Yeah, so they're not, again, they're trying to fit data, but they're trying to ask a question, okay? There's this number, three halves, why is it three halves? Can I explain it 
with some complex mechanism. So these are the reactions. And then what do you do? You take these reactions. The rate of initiation is equal to some rate constant K times the concentration of CH3CHO. They assume each of these reactions are elementary. So they make that assumption as well. There's a series of elementary reactions. The elementary reactions follow mass action kinetics. So you just, and again, they're very simple. They say these are not even equilibrium reactions or reversible reactions. They just say they're forward reactions, one direction. So Ki, initiation reaction, rate constant times the concentration of acid aldehyde, then uh, constant, the termination step is lowercase kt, I had to fix that, times uh, methyl radical concentration squared, and the propagation steps, the rate of propagation step one is kp1, methyl concentration times acid aldehyde concentration, rate of kp2, uh, yeah, rate of uh, propagation step two is kp2 times the CH3CO concentration. And then they start to write out these mass balance equations in a batch reactor, okay? And they just say it. You have the rate of change of acid aldehyde, just like we saw previously, okay? For every single reaction, we can say you have a rate of change of species. So rate of change of acid aldehyde is initiation step rate minus the rate of initiation times the concentration of acid aldehyde. And it's also being used, consumed in the propagation step where methyl ra radical reacts with acid aldehyde. It's also consuming acid aldehyde. So there's two reactions in the whole sequence that are consuming acid aldehyde. You write those two together. Similarly, for methyl radical, it's formed in the first step. It's consumed in the first propagation step as it reacts with acid aldehyde. And it was produced in the second propagation step when CH3CO decomposes to make methyl and it's also consumed in the termination step. So they write down all these, uh, uh, they write down this equation for the mass balance of methyl. The same thing for, uh, this should be CH3CO. It's right on your slides, yeah? Not on mine, okay, I have to fix some of these. So CH3CO is related again, propagation step one, where it's being produced from abstraction by acid aldehyde and is consumed in that scission reaction, propagation step two. And then you have the rate of change of methane, uh, the rate of change of carbon monoxide, which is only produced in the final uh, KP2 propagation step, and the rate of change of ethane, uh, the termination step rate times the concentration of uh, CH3 squared, methyl radical squared. And then they make the assumption that, again, as we saw last time, radicals are very short-lived species. So in this mechanism, you have stable species and you have radicals. And the radicals are very short-lived because as soon as they're formed, they're consumed. So they, they make that simple quasi-steady state approximation, which says that the rate of change of radical species as a function of time is zero. So they make the assumption D, D methyl concentration with respect to time and the rate of change of CH3CO with respect to time equals to zero. If you do this, you put zero here, and you put zero here, and then you equate the left and right sides. So you get Kp1 from the first methyl radical concentration being zero. You get Kp1 CH3 times uh, concentration of CH3CO equals Kp2 times CH3CO. Same thing you do by equating this uh, CH3CO concentration to zero. You could get this equation. And then you can say the concentration of methyl radicals is equal to K1 over 2KT times CH3CHO acid aldehyde concentration to the one half. And finally, you can uh, write out for the rate of change of methane with respect to time, KP1 times the change in methyl concentration, KI over 2KT times rate of concentration of CH3CO to the one half times the concentration of CHCO. And they get the formation rate of methane is some rate constant K times CH3CO to the one half, or so to the three halves. So simple mass balances, they all work out and you get three halves at the end. And they say, voila, this is the reaction mechanism. It fits exactly the experimental observations. If you assume these reaction steps are happening, you assume that the methyl radicals and the CH3CO radicals are in quasi steady state because they're radicals and you do the very simple uh, mass balance, you get 
three halves, and it matches exactly the experimental observation. And then they said, this is exactly what's happening. And well, they, people believed it. Well, people actually didn't believe them. <laughs> These guys were in Johns Hopkins University, and people in Johns Hopkins had no idea what was happening in, uh, in, in Europe, in UK. So they actually thought they were crazy. They thought, this is useless science. These guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and uh, th also, that's why the dean didn't like Rice. They thought their science was no good. So they did this for like six years. They wrote this actually schemes for many different reactions for, with hydrocarbons, and nobody thought it was important. Then Hinshelwood eventually met these guys in the US at some meeting, and then they, they found that everything actually aligns and it makes sense. So uh, these were the first reaction mechanisms for hydrocarbons. And it was, yeah, it was fascinating for, the, for them to reveal, again, just four reaction steps could, could explain a very complex behavior. Okay, now acid aldehyde, there's papers published every year, okay? I think there was a paper published even like three months ago on, again, acid aldehyde decomposition because it's not always three halves. It was three halves in those days over a very limited temperature and pressure range. But of course, acid aldehyde decomposition doesn't happen in a four-step mechanism. It happens in maybe uh, 100 steps. It's very complicated. And it changes a lot with temperature, with pressure, with concentrations of different species. And again, this is a, it's a classical problem. And I say even today, I don't think we have a complete mechanism for acid aldehyde. It's, it's very complicated. Okay, so where did these guys get the idea? Well, Rice and Hirschfeld, they got the ideas of these chain reactions from something that happened earlier uh, in, in Germany and in Austria. This was a, a chemist named Bax Bodenstein, very famous. Uh, he first found out that there's things called free radical reaction or, or yeah, chain reactions, let's say. Reactions that happen sequentially and eventually it ends, right? So how they found this out is they had hydrogen and chlorine and uh, they used UV light, okay? And they initiate a photochemical reaction. So, they initiate with one photon, and they found that hydrogen and chlorine, with just the initiation of one photon, they can get millions of hydrogen chloride product species being formed. And this is, again, not done at any high temperature or anything. So a single photon somehow activates the reaction and allows it to go to completion, yeah? All it needed was one single in initiation. So they said there was a primary reaction, the absorption of a photon, and it creates a chlorine radical, and then this chlorine radical reacts with hydrogen and uh, produces hydrogen chloride, but at the same time it makes an H radical, which then allows chlorine to be activated, and like this, the process keeps continuing. And he looked at his wife's gold chain, or the, uh, the watch, the chain for the, for the watch, and he said it's like a, a chain. Uh, if this, initially the link of this chain is open, and there's no reaction happening. As soon as you close the chain, it creates a cycle. That photon closes the chain. It creates a cycle, and eventually, all of the reactants uh, will be consumed and made products. And the first word, this uh, term chain reaction, was in the PhD thesis of a student of Bodenstein. Yeah, uh, his name was Christensen. And he found out, yeah, he, he was the one who wrote the thesis about these first chain reactions. But again, the chain reaction, we'll see, only had initiation, uh, propagation, and termination steps as, it, as they relate to photochemical reactions, not for thermal reactions like we see in acid aldehyde or other types of uh, combustion systems. So again, how, how do they do this? Just very much the same way, right? So Bodenstein and Lind, Christensen, these guys were all together in Austria and Germany doing research together. They're doing different types of reactions. In this case, hydrogen plus bromine were reacted to make hydrogen bromide. And again, when they did the experiments, they found a weird rate equation. It's bromine raised to the three halves. And there's even like uh, sometimes a denominator term, K prime times the concentration of hydrogen bromide. So again, it's not a simple, it's not following simple mass action kinetics. Something complex is happening. And then in Christensen's thesis in 1919, he presented the reaction mechanism, okay? So bromine plus uh, some third body. 
could be a photochemical reaction, could be initiated by pressure. He just says the bromine splits apart to make two bromo radicals. Bromo re reacts with hydrogen to make hydrogen bromide. H plus Br2 can also become hydrogen bromide plus Br. So this hydrogen is propagating. Bromo radical then uh, is formed. Then H plus HBr becomes hydrogen plus bromine. And eventually at termination step, 2Br plus M goes to Br2 uh, bromine plus uh, M. And again, this was made by Hirschfeld who we saw previously, right? Hirschfeld is the guy who went to the US later on and came to Johns Hopkins. So he was working with Bodenstein and Lind before he went to the US. And Polanyi uh, was a Hungarian chemist, uh, not to be confused with his son, John Polanyi, who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, this Polanyi went to Toronto, Canada, and uh, yeah, he was a professor there. He did not win the Nobel Prize, but he did a lot of work on these reactions, also transition state theory. And then, uh, then his son, John Polanyi, won the Nobel Prize eventually, also for, for more things related to quantum chemistry and transition state theory. It, but that was much later, in the, in the 70s. Okay, so you have these uh, different reaction steps. And maybe uh, I want you guys just to look at these. Remember, and. Any reaction mechanism, I said you have carriers, chain carriers, react steps that carry the chain, that keep it going, or propagation steps. You have uh, inhibition or termination steps. You can have branching steps, and uh, you can have all the yeah, termination steps. So inhibition steps are propagating steps which don't make more radicals. Branching steps produce more radicals. Termination is the final recombination of two radicals. So just, I want you to look at this, maybe discuss with your partner, what do you think, you look at these five reactions, how would you classify them? Tell me, which ones, take a minute or two, talk to your neighbor, how, which ones do you think are initiation, which ones are propagation, which ones are branching, and which are termination? All right, what do you guys think? So the first, first reaction is what? Initiation. Okay, so the first one, yeah, bromine just dissociates into 2Br. Okay, the second one? Branching. Oh, some people say branching. Why branching? Okay, well, HBr is stable. Yeah, hydrogen bromide, okay, it's stable. Yeah, you might, that I didn't explain to you, but yeah, H, again, you have bromine and Br2 and H2, the product is hydrogen bromide, HBr. So that's a propagation, right? Okay, then the third one. Okay, also propagation. The fourth one. Okay, 
well, the fourth one is just the reverse of the second one, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's the same reaction. They just wrote it in the forward and backward ways. So it's also propagation. And then the last one, termination. And what is the last one? Well, it, it's just the reverse of the first one, right? So again, they didn't even make it a different reaction. They just said it's the it's a reverse of the first reaction. And uh, again, the, the overall rate reaction was hydrogen plus uh, bromine, H2. And unlike the iodine, uh, hydrogen, and iodine experiment, this one uh, displayed complex kinetics. Hydrogen plus iodine did not display complex kinetics in the first experiment. So, so they, again, they found this uh, rate equation, uh, rate equation, sum rate constant uh, times hydrogen concentration times bromine concentration raised to three halves divided by one plus some rate, different rate constant, K double prime, times the HBr concentration divided by bromine concentration. And then they said this is not the law of mass action. Law of mass action should look like this. And again, they did not assume, they assumed it was just a forward reaction. So the law of mass action, if you only assume a forward reaction, should look like this. And these are the different steps uh, they postulated in Christensen's thesis. Uh, interesting, they, they said the first step was bromine dissociation. They didn't say it was hydrogen dissociation. And again, it was simple thermochemistry, bond dissociation energy. Bromine has a lower bond dissociation energy, about half or less than half of uh, that of hydrogen. It's 46 kilocalories more for bromine to break apart, whereas it's 104 for uh, hydrogen. So that's why they said bromine is the first thing to break, and therefore that's, that's the uh, potential initiation step. Uh, now you can start to write the concentration of hydrogen bromide with respect to temperature, the product. It's uh, K2 times H2 times Br, because hydrogen bromide is formed in reaction two. It's formed in reaction three, so you have this equation. And it's consumed in reaction four, which is the reverse of reaction three. So minus K4 H, H radical concentration times HBr. And then everything is the same, just like I showed you for uh, acid aldehyde. They, uh, they write down these different equations. So they write the equation uh, rate of change of hydrogen radical with respect to temperature, uh, time, sorry, bromo radical with respect to time. You get these equations. They say these are radicals, so they are short-lived. So you have a steady state approximation. You equate these to zero, and based on these steady state uh, approximations, uh, you can determine then bromo co radical concentration, H radical concentration with these equations, and eventually you do all your substitution, and in the end you get, okay, dHBr dt is this complex equation, but in the end you see that all these k's, you can lump them together into some kind of pseudo rate constant, and all of these k4 and k3, you lump them together in some pseudo rate constant, and then you get something that looks just like what they measure. So hydrogen plus bromine raised to the one half, hydrogen bromide divided by bromo bromine concentrations. And again, this is just nothing fancy going on. It's just a simple observation that observes the ex matches with the experiments and, and assuming that uh, the scheme follows a complex reaction mechanism. Traditionally, if people saw this kind of, you know, rate equation, they had measured these in other systems. Like in catalysis, we see this a lot, right? In catalysis systems, uh, when you have a molecule that has to absorb onto a surface, then uh, and then uh, react on the surface and desorb, we call this langmuir hinshelwood kinetics. You see things in the denominator. Some reactants actually slow down the rate. For example, here you see bromine slows down the rate of formation of hydrogen bromide, which is non-intuitive. Why would a reactant lower the rate of the reaction? In catalysis, that happens because reactants come and they take up active sites, and as they take up more active sites, they prevent the reaction from happening. But in this type of gas phase reaction, that can't be happening. So again, they, they had to explain these things in different ways, 
And they explain, again, it's a simple radical mechanism. Here, in acid aldehyde, it came out to work to three halves. Well, in this reaction mechanism, you see it follows a more complex scheme where you have even things in the, in the den denominator. So, yeah, let's take a, let's take a break now, and uh, we'll cover some more things about uh, chain reactions after.